Coming up at 4 o'clock this afternoon, it's All Things Considered from NPR. We begin this hour by going into the interview studio with Judith Merriweather. Joining me in the KRVS studios this afternoon, I'm really happy to say, is Dr. Daryl Felder. He is a professor of biology here at UL Lafayette. And many of our listeners, Daryl, may remember we spoke with you earlier in the year about uh, your book that came out. Uh, it's a volume one of uh, an amazing uh, research project. It's called Gulf of Mexico Origin, Waters, and Biota. It's the volume one, Biodiversity, and you co-authored that. And uh, you are, I guess, one of the editors of the entire series. So we spoke a bit about that, and that was pre-oil spill. Right. Um, somebody's going to come up with a little anachronism for that <laughs> uh, before oil spill or something. Um, and you have just recently received uh, a rapid grant from the National Science Foundation along with your colleague Suzanne Frederick, who was also in here not too long ago talking about a collection trip uh, she and some of her students had done in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, you've been getting a lot of people calling, wanting quick little answers, um, sure. bits of information. But as you mentioned earlier, um, you and your colleagues and the University of Louisiana at Lafayette have some 40 years of research in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, in data, in publications. This is not a new field of study for you. Not at all. And uh, these are not easy and quick answers, even though people want that now. They're not. They're yeah. not. The easy answer is what everybody wants, and the complex truth is often what you get. Right. Now, the rapid grant that you just received uh, will um, help you and Suzanne Frederick and others involved with you go down to the Gulf and determine some of the changes that have happened. But the only reason you're going to be able to do that is because of um, this research, this uh, massive research that you all have acquired. Uh, briefly describe your book, Biodiversity, and, and that series that you sure. were involved with. Sure. It's, uh, it, it actually uh, is funded by the Hart Institute for Gulf of Mexico Studies in Corpus Christi, Texas, based at Texas A&M Corpus Christi. And uh, colleagues of mine there and I some years ago, about seven years ago now, began talking about doing this series really to build on something that was last done in 1954, which was kind of pathetic by comparison because they simply didn't have the database. Well, we thought, okay, a nice big book might cover this. Well, now it's a seven volume and you know, the first one came out and it's almost 14,000 pages. So uh, this thing has turned into a huge task. But uh, fortunately, uh, the first one that we decided to do, which is the one you mentioned that I was the uh, senior editor on, uh, was focused on biodiversity, which is the biota. And uh, it came out last summer, uh, just about the time everybody was picking up copies for the first time and kind of looking over this massive inventory, uh, we get this all spill. And so uh, it has suddenly become popular, and uh, it's going to be a reference uh, source for people to go back and look at at least what was up till that point in time. And uh, so it, it's, it's a database. Now, just like putting that database together, um, you know, took a long time. It took an awful long time to put together the data upon which it was uh, based upon. And that, that really goes back for over a hundred years if you go into the literature. Mm -hmm. uh, in our own cases here at UL, those of us who participated in the book and wrote chapters uh, draw on research that in some cases for us older folks like me uh, does in fact extend back uh, over 40 years and so there were a lot of things published there for the first time ever Mm -hmm. um, now, your main interest, I know you're a head of the um, Laboratory for Crustacean Research here at the university, and um, obviously you've published a lot on crustaceans and, and have a real uh, interest in what's happening to them. I know that your colleague, Susan, Suzanne Frederick, is very interested in the algaes of the Gulf. When you um, work with this rapid grant from the National Science Foundation, what are the two of you going to be studying specifically? Will you study your interest and right. she'll study the algae? How, how are you going to work it on this project? It does seem like an odd mix mm -hmm. and it's really, uh, it's again, it goes back to what we did before. Um, uh, between night, between 2004 and 2006, over a three year period, we had um, a major grant uh, from the National Science Foundation. And she and I, you know, between the two of us, we've had a couple of million dollars of support from them for various kinds of studies. But one of them that we had together was specifically uh, from the Biological Surveys and Inventories, or Biotic Surveys and Inventories program in their Division of Environmental Biology, and that was to go into the Gulf of Mexico and look at what were regarded as neglected habitats. 
uh, particularly banks that were between depths of about 55 and 90 meters. And those banks, you know, some people would call them reefs. Well, they're kind of below where coral occurs. In fact, very much below where typical, what we would call hermatypic corals uh, occur. And so <clears throat> we can go in and sample those with small dredges and uh, determine what lives on them. The odd mix of crustaceans and algae, why do that? Well, there are two indicator groups. Both of them are specios, which means they're both known to be diverse worldwide. And so they're good indicators of, of um, basically resiliency, complexity uh, of, of what lives in these environments. One is plant, and so one is a primary producer, a producer of oxygen uh, at the base of the food chain. It's algae. And uh, fortunately, I have a colleague here, Suzanne Frederick, who's a world authority on them. And the other one is, you know, my favorite group, crustaceans. And, and even I don't cover all of them because there's over a, a, a thousand species of just the ones that I do in the Gulf of Mexico, which are the crab, shrimps, and lobsters, one of the big guys. Then there's all these little ones that we farmed out to other people. But between the two of us, we had a, a plant producer group and we had an animal consumer group. And so we could talk, we could speak to the issue of environmental complexity from two perspectives. So what happens is we're on a research vessel, we take a sample, you know, all too often when people are sampling, they're after their little bugger and the rest of it goes overboard. Well, we didn't do that because we're working on both sides of a table and I have my doctoral students and she has her doctoral students. We got our postdocs and they're all cross-trained to recognize good things. And uh, so as we're picking through, she is helping remove from these, this, this is a debris-like material. It's, it's very much like ground-up rock. Mm. And we pick, it's got a lot of tiny sponges and a little fouling materials. We pick through this very carefully on the deck of the ship. And uh, we've kind of learned each other's groups as we've gone along. And as we do it, you know, if you don't have a trained eye, you don't know what you're seeing. Uh, the fact that she's got a very trained eye with the algae, I have a trained eye with the crustaceans, means that we kind of know what we're looking for outright. And it's a great place to train students. It's pathetic how many students have to learn materials sometimes only from preserved things in jars. You get out there and you finally see them, you go, oh my gosh, that thing's beautiful. Oh my gosh, look where it lives. Oh my gosh, look, these are living together. What does this all mean? So we've had a great time on these cruises. And they've been extremely productive and, and we've got a real good handshaking ability here. Having that baseline from those previous three years, we were set up to do this because one way we justified that going throughout the Gulf of Mexico, and I mean even Mexican waters in this case, was to say, look, these deep banks are in fact salt domes, and most of them are in fact intrusive salt domes, and that is where we do have a lot of energy production uh, in coast Louisiana. You know, what if something should happen in one of these areas? Are these like islands that have endemics living on them that live there and nowhere else? No one knew. Well, we know now to some extent, and uh, we've done a lot of genetic measures in order to assure this. So we're actually going in with gene sequence, what we collect, uh, to try to nail down identification. It's not one of these gestalt things where we just look at it and say, oh, that looks like a new one of these. It's, it's much more complex than that. Mm -hmm. Well, those kinds of um, insights are invaluable because many of us know occasions where mm, people have made claims about, oh, it's so dangerous to eat this because there are now high levels. Well, there were no baselines before at some point, so we don't, we didn't know. Um, but what you and your colleagues have done is given us a baseline, and from that point, you are able to study what the effects are. And as Suzanne was saying when she was here with some of her students, that they do know of um, examples of algae that um, are more resilient than others, and so they're anxious to see if some of those um, understandings are borne out in future research.